camera on. I must put my camera on. Hang on, comrade Lucien. Okay. Cool. Uh, I'll turn around the screen so that you can see the comrades. Oh, thanks, Com. It's. Uh... Okay. Got it. I don't know if you are able to see the comrades. Um, I can't see anyone at the moment. Section. I'm seeing your icon. Oh, you seeing the icon? Oh, I closed my thing. Um, okay. There we go. Uh, let's see. Well, it's one section wait, of the school. Wait, 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 wait. Um, <laughs> Which one, comrade? This one. This one. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll let you begin now, comrade. This is over to you. Comrade, one has already done the introduction. Okay, come. I can't see anyone on your side. Um. Have you got it pointing to anyone? Yeah. Okay, I can't see anyone. But anyway, um, let me just do one fiddling bit here. Sure. No, I can't see anybody. Can we see you. Yeah, I can. You can see me, huh? Yeah. Oh, um, let me do a fiddle here. Window. Okay, I can't see anybody, but anyway. Um, okay. Um, how are you, comrades? Hello. Hi there. <laughs> okay, comrades, I, I can't see you at all, eh? But you can see me. Okay. That's fine. You can talk with them. Okay. Okay, so what should I do? What do you want me to do? Shall I start? Continue on, we can see you. Okay. We can see you, we can hear you. Okay, so great. Can... So, comrades, how long do I have? 20 minutes, come. 25 minutes. Okay, lucky man. Okay, I can't see anyone there, but I can hear you guys. Okay. All right, so um, I was asked to speak about uh, thinking about the rise of the right at the moment and how we can deal with that. Um, and I, I wanted to first just thank the comrades and Ilrig for involving me. Um, and I hope I can add something. I think internationally what we're seeing over the last 10, 15 years is the rise of quite a widespread uh, right-wing populist current whether that's exemplified by Trump in uh, the United States or Brexit in Britain or Erdogan in Turkey, developments, for example, around Modi in uh, India. There's lots of others, Hungary. Um, we can talk about Brazil and so on. So this is a global development. And I think if it's a global thing, we can't understand it just in relation to the dynamics in one particular country. We have to look at global processes that are are enabling this and we have to look at global ways we can respond and I think we also need to have some sort of broad definition that can uh, understand and capture what we're trying to talk about. Now I'm describing this as authoritarian populism. It's not really a movement um, with a coherent ideology. For various reasons as I'll explain later, I don't think it's fascism, which is something quite specific. What we can see in this movement is it's really quite heavily around style rather than very often substance. A very large part of it is around the emergence of a strong leader who presents himself or herself as the voice of ordinary people, as an enemy of the establishment. And when we say populist, we mean for the people. And that's very much how this model presents itself. It's got a very rhetorical uh, style based on bombast, conspiracy theories, um, very strong elements of a personality cult. But there again, it's hard to really work out what the ideology is. This isn't a personality cult like, say, that around Stalin, who at least wrote a lot of books and gave a lot of speeches and was very concerned about the ideology. I mean, this is much more something that presents itself as an emotional movement, as quick responses, off-the-cuff 
Um, and it's something which is very, very good at playing the media. So it really understands how to use the media and how to get media attention. So it's something able to weaponize uh, media. It's able to use a, a very uh, problematic media arrangement we have these days to get a lot of publicity. Now, I said it's not fascist, and let me explain that. Fascism is historically an ideology and a movement that is actually quite quite coherent. Fascism proper, whether we're talking about, say, the green shirt movement in Brazil in the 1930s, whether we're talking about uh, the Hindutva movements, which later led into the BJP in um, India, whether we're talking about Nazism or we're talking about Mussolini's movement. Fascism is explicitly anti-parliamentary. Fascism argues explicitly for a hierarchical reinscription of power in society, and it's openly anti-democratic. Fascism is also something which organizes itself to a large extent outside of the state through paramilitary organization. This is exactly where shirt movements like the green shirts in Brazil in the 1930s come up, or the militias associated with what is now the BJP. So fascism is a movement which might sometimes use parliament, but it's actually opposed to parliament as such. And fascism is not a movement that is primarily predicated on electoral victories. It doesn't actually require those. Those could be useful, but fascism is really about building quite a power um, outside of the state through militia organizations. So in South Africa, if you want something similar, something which was very close to fascism in the 1990s would be the Inkata Freedom Party. Um, with its MP, with its uh, violent attacks on democratic movements, with its hierarchical anti-democratic ethos. The last thing is fascism is a preventative counter-revolution. So fascist movements normally take power when a large section of the ruling class, particularly around monopoly capital, is worried about a, a actual social revolution from the left. So fascism, as it emerged from the 1920s onwards, has really been something which has been put up as a bulwark against revolution. It's not coincidental that you've got fascism emerging in countries like Germany in the 1920s, um, or you've got fascism emerging in Brazil in the 1930s. It's not at all a coincidental thing. But the movements we've got now are something very different. They use parliament. What they argue is rather that parliament has been captured by the establishment so they present themselves as reinscribing the people in parliament. They use electoral machinery. And whatever dramatic statements they may say, you can't judge these guys on what they tweet or what off-the-cuff statements they make. There isn't really some sort of real evidence at this stage of these movements moving to the abolition of parliamentary democracy or bourgeois democratic forms. Um, Although they have popular support, they're not really based on a large-scale mass mobilization. The mass mobilization tends to be quite passive, um, people listening to speeches, but it's not really about building some sort of street force. Um, and it doesn't really have a very clear ideology. Now, we could try to solve the problem by redefining fascism and saying fascism evolves, but most attempts to redefine fascism to include authoritarian populism in fascism end up making fascism something so vague as to be absolutely meaningless. If you say fascism doesn't require a street power, if you say fascism doesn't require an abolition of parliament, well, what makes it fascist? Um, you end up with something very, very vague. What you're dealing here is something that doesn't have a coherent ideology, and fundamentally it is not a movement responding to a revolutionary crisis in society. There is very few places in the world today where the prospect of a working class or socialist revolution is on the table. So there aren't ruling classes sitting around the world thinking, how can we stop the working class in Germany seizing power or the Indian working class? People are not worried about that. Another approach to these movements, which I think is mistaken, is to define them simply as a form of neoliberalism. Now, I don't think these authoritarian fascists, these are, sorry, excuse me, these authoritarian populist movements are intrinsically neoliberal. It is true that these movements, and Trump is a good example, favor massive tax cuts within their home countries, quite a lot of deregulation. Um, it is true that they rail against big government and so on. But internationally, internationally, once we start to look there, this idea that they're neoliberal. Oh, I can see comrades. Hello. You guys have popped up. I can see you guys in the camera. I can see you with the red cap. Hello. Anyway, um, but internationally, oh, this feels much better. It's weird talking to myself. Anyway, 
internationally, I don't think these movements are neoliberal. Um, if you look at the trade wars in which they engage, we are really talking about movements that are actually threatening the international order of free trade. This isn't a small thing. When somebody like Donald Trump starts to restrict imports, this is going back to something like the 1940s, 1950s. When states start to bring in incentives to renationalize industry, for example, trying to bring American industry back into America through tax cuts, through trying to raise wages in Mexico, through putting money back into infrastructure, however poorly, however much they haven't got this done, this points to rather an instrumental use of neoliberalism. So it's not necessarily against uh, free markets. It's trying to use free markets for a nationalist purpose. But by the same token, it's also open, I think, to abandoning free markets entirely in favor of national capitalism. I mean, what matters here is its focus on national capitalism. It's not a focus on free markets as such. If it was entirely about free markets, it would be difficult to understand the massive backlash these are facing, for example, from the Democrats in America. All right, so I'm saying this is authoritarian populist movements. They they don't have the features of classical fascism. They can't really be described purely as neoliberalism. Instead, I think when we look at what's caused them, we have to understand them as, in many ways, a response to neoliberalism. Um, and let me explain what I mean. So their response to neoliberalism that isn't necessarily abandoning neoliberalism, although they're very ambivalent towards neoliberalism. The first thing is that neoliberalism is based on a massive fragmentation in society. When we look at the, the current neoliberal period, we can see, for example, massive fragmentation within working classes. We get declining wages, rising unemployment, the, uh, the end in many cases of lifetime employment, and this is reflected also in the tensions in the working class, whether we see an increase of gender-based violence, of intolerance, of hatred towards foreigners. So under the massive pressures of neoliberalism, working class is actually fragmenting. And that is part of the context for these movements as sections of working classes turn on other sections of the working classes. But ruling classes are also fragmenting. Although in all countries there's a substantial section of the national ruling class that aims to internationalize, that in many ways wants to globalize, that wants to be cosmopolitan, that isn't the whole ruling class. There are sections of ruling classes that are very damaged by neoliberalism. Um, you can see it in South Africa where a large part of the ruling class wants protection from the market, whether that's in the form of trade barriers for textiles or poultry, whether that is in the form of black economic empowerment deals, whether that's in the form of getting secure state contracts. So the, the neoliberal thing is also creating a lot of conflicts within ruling classes. And I would see the general situation in ruling classes these days as, as a bit of a crisis of leadership. What we had 20 years ago where there was a complete consensus around neoliberalism has broken down. So ruling classes don't altogether know what to do. And this, in particular, sections of the ruling class based in states are also worried about the loss of state power um, due to economic uh, uh, decline. The other thing is neoliberalism is a very unstable, uneven system. I'm not saying it's one that's going to collapse, but what characterizes it is it is not based on long-term booms, um, sustained increase in industry, jobs, and so on. It's based on recurrent crises. It's based on a sense of disintegration and apocalypse. And I think around the world, if you speak, speak to people in younger generations, the idea that there can be some better future has almost disappeared. And this is rooted in the conditions of neoliberalism, the sense of an impending environmental collapse, of national crisis, of social disintegration, of endless corruption. So neoliberalism kind of creates the context where people are looking for quick, easy solutions, and they're looking for somebody to fix the problems. They're looking for a Moses figure. And related to this, why don't people turn back to other solidarities, working class struggle, national liberation movements? Well, the thing is, these larger solidarities and projects have also been breaking down. So we see, for example, the decline of trade unions in many, many countries. We see, for example, a crisis of the old worker, socialist, social democratic and communist parties. 
we see many of those political parties, for example, the Labour Party in Britain, as parties that have very much uh, betrayed the working class. They don't present any real alternative to neoliberalism. They simply want to provide a nicer neoliberalism that is perhaps a bit more diverse. So the larger projects in which many working class people were invested have either disintegrated or turned on the working class. And in South Africa, a good example is the African National Congress, which 10 years ago you could barely criticize in public. And today, even those who support it, they support it as a lesser evil, not because they believe it's going to fix things. They've given up hope. They just think the other things are worse. So that sense of hope of larger projects is disintegrated. And what's taken its place is a politics of uh, identity, where people stress difference between each other, where people take offense on all sorts of issues, where um, we can't talk about a women's movement without that fragmenting onto different types of women. We can't talk about a workers' movement without that fragmenting into differences between workers. And intellectually and in the large intellectual world, we have a development of what many people would call postmodernism, which is the idea there is no real truth. There's no real truth in society. There's no way of understanding society. Everything is up to you. You can define who you are. You can define what you want. You can define what is true. Now, that say, may seem like something quite emancipatory, but that postmodern idea is exactly consistent with neoliberalism, where society is fragmented, where people don't see any way out, where everything seems to be up to the individual, where what seems to matter is how you consume as an individual and how you perform your identity. So in this sort of context, people who are looking for a return to some larger solidarity do tend to find it with these, with these right populist parties, which say, look, we will make America great again, or Britain will get out of the EU, or we will get rid of the Christians and Muslims in India, or we will deal with the Kurds in Turkey. People see this as a solution, and in South Africa as well, where we will get the Indians out of government, or we will... Um, evict the foreigners from the country. So those ideas for many people provide a sort of warped substitute um, solidarity. Um, the, the German Marxist August Bebel said in the, in the 1800s that anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jews, is the socialism of idiots. And I think in many ways this new authoritarian populism is the socialism of fools. People are looking for some way to respond to capitalism, but they're, f they're finding the solution in false solutions that actually reproduce the problems we've got by dividing people, by not tackling the deeper problem of capitalism itself, by not tackling the problem that there is a ruling class in society. So in America, people say, let's vote for Trump to get the establishment out. But Trump is part of the establishment. Trump is a billionaire. In South Africa, people say, well, let's maybe support Zuma or Julius Malema. These are millionaires. So rather than solve the problem, people are reproducing the problem. Now, why hasn't the left been able to deal with this? When I'm talking about the left, I'm talking about the broad socialist and working class movement. I think that there's a number of reasons. The one is that a lot of the left was committed to models of socialism based on the state. The Keynesian welfare state in the Western countries, Marxist Leninism in the East, and nationalism, anti imperialist nationalism in the South. But all of those models have collapsed from 1989. So the left pretty much bet on the state as the organ of emancipation, but the state failed. The Keynesian welfare state collapsed in the 1970s and was replaced by neoliberalism, and the Social Democrats, like New Labour in Britain, became neoliberal. Communist parties which had invested their souls, their hearts in the Soviet Union found the Soviet Union collapsed. China from 1977 abandoned Marxist-Leninist central planning. So my point is there's a vacuum. In the old days, many of these problems would have been dealt with by massive trade union mobilizations, massive left mobilizations. We would have dealt with unemployment through massive unemployment mobilizations demanding jobs. Right now, we don't deal with that. People vote rather for a party which they think will deliver some future by uh, clearing the country of foreigners and others. Now, what this also means, a lot of the left has been unable to sketch an alternative program. On the one side, its program around um, using the state has failed. Um, it's simply not viable these days to have a Keynesian welfare state. It won't work in the current neoliberal condition. It's not going to happen. Um, it's v unviable to go back to import substitution industrialization. It's not going to happen. So a lot of the left doesn't know what to do. So they're trying to either revive the dead, 
which I don't think any of us can do. Or they are proposing things, or they are proposing things that are not very different to what the authoritarian populists propose. I mean, while a lot of people are very critical of, say, Donald Trump, what Donald Trump is suggesting, for example, increasing wages in Mexico so that jobs don't leave America to go to Mexico, or restricting free trade, is not that different to what, for example, Casatu proposes. Casatu is for economic nationalism, a restriction on free trade, uh, leveling up wages, making sure companies don't leave the country. The other problem is that the left has betrayed the working class. Large parts of the left, for example, the New Labour Party in Britain, the Democrats in America, to the extent we can call them left, um, the African National Congress in South Africa, have betrayed the working class. It's not simply that neoliberalism happened in the teeth of opposition from the old parties of the working class. Those parties facilitated neoliberalism. Sometimes they've corrected course a bit, the German Social Democrats, but until recently the German Social Democrats were as neoliberal on substantive issues as their rivals. Now this has led to a situation where the left has often been unable to deal with the authoritarian populace. To the extent it has dealt with the authoritarian populace, it's either dealt with a straw man, and I'll explain what I mean, or it's lined up with sections of the, of the ruling class. A straw man is when you argue with something that doesn't really exist. You argue with, a, with, with something false. So I argue with a scarecrow. I don't argue with my enemy. So setting up the problem around Trump as fascism might make people very happy and they can go fight a few people from the Ku Klux Klan. But the problem of Trump isn't fascism. It's not, fascism is a problem, but dealing with Trump as a fascist doesn't actually solve the problem because he's not a fascist. Or they say the problem is these guys are neoliberal and we'll deal with them as neoliberals. But they're not just neoliberals. They're using neoliberalism, but they're not pure neoliberals, and I don't think they're intrinsically long-term committed to neoliberalism. So fighting them as fascists or fighting them as neoliberals is missing a large part of the problem. Other parts of the left are trying to wish away the problem by simply denying it exists. So you get a lot of studies from America, including and from Britain, including by anarchists, including by Marxists, which try to pretend the working class doesn't support these parties. Um, this is done in various tricks. That's just a way of ignoring the problem. Obviously, the working class supports a lot of this. Not all the working class, but there is substantial working class support. Any survey in South Africa will show how widespread ideas of xenophobia are, how widespread ideas of crude nationalism actually are. So some of the left is dealing with the problem of straw men. Some of the left is pretending the problem isn't there. And the last thing here is a lot of the left is really struggling to deal with a changed ruling class. The reality is a section of the ruling class does support and has appropriated, captured, taken over many things that were part of the left. Let me give one example to illustrate my point and then I will, I will summarize it a bit. The Rand Merchant Bank in South Africa, which is one of the biggest investment banks in the continent of Africa, that is owned in the private sector, as part of First National Bank, has got a program called Athena. The Athena program is a program to develop women managers in the bank. So it's aiming at really developing very powerful women capitalists in the bank. And this is explicitly framed in a feminist language. Nike Corporation, which is famous for its sweatshops in Asia, has got a campaign called The Girl Effect, and it is specifically promoting the education of young women. Now, these aren't bad things in themselves, but the point is that the ruling class, a large part of the ruling class, has captured, has appropriated a lot of feminism, anti-racism, and so on. And a lot of the left finds it very hard to deal with this, because the assumption is that we're dealing with a ruling class from the 1950s that was openly sexist, that supported xenophobia, that supported racism. A section of the ruling class doesn't. A section of ruling classes around the world are in favor of diversity, are in favor of equality, are in favor of immigration. And a lot of the left doesn't understand this. So what they do then is, in, for example, opposing Trump's immigration policies, they end up aligning with a section of the ruling class that is in favor of immigration. When they worry about Trump's view of the past of America, they end up aligning with a section of the ruling class that has a similar view. Now, what this means is that you end up with a lot of the left that is unable to distinguish its politics from those of the more progressive elements of the bourgeoisie. And that means in practice, for example, a lot of American left supports the Democrats over Trump. 
effectively, rather than pose an alternative to elections, they are supporting electing a lesser evil. A lot of the left there has ended up in a situation where it is literally supporting criminal organizations like the FBI and CIA investigating the government on the grounds that these are champions of democracy. When you can get to a situation where large parts of the left actually support the CIA, I think we have a good idea of what I mean when the left, unable to distinguish itself from the ruling class and committed to a politics of lesser evilism, actually ends up aligning with parts of the ruling class and therefore unable to fill the gap that these people like Trump walk into. So what I'm saying is if a lot of people are supporting the right-wing populist, authoritarian populist because they feel betrayed by parties of the ruling class, when a large part of the ruling of the working class left then supports those very same parties that have betrayed the working class, they are driving people into the arms of the authoritarian populace. They are responding in ways that deepen the problem, whether that's accepting toxic forms of debate, identity politics, whether that is not dealing with the question of immigration and the national question properly, whether that is supporting the CIA, whether that is taking sides between the ruling class. So what is the solution here? Um, I think to have a solution, you've got to diagnose the problem. I'm saying the problem here of authoritarian populism is first neoliberalism, in that neoliberalism has created the conditions of pain, suffering, inequality that are leading people to react. The working class will react whether we are ready or not. So we need to react in a way that can reach out to the working class rather than cut us off, off it. Authoritarian populism is also possible because of the lack of a vision on the left. Too much of the left is stuck in the 1950s. We need to come up with concrete, realistic visions for the left. And those are not the Keynesian welfare state. Those are not nationalism. We need to look at what's happening in Rojava, for example, where people are building outside of the state, outside of the party system, and are building alternatives from below. So we need to meet the fragmentation of society that fosters the rise of authoritarian populism with a politics of solidarity, class struggle, and non-racialism. We need to meet the, the visions that are being put forward by the authoritarian populists with a real alternative both to the authoritarian populists and to the neoliberals, rather than take sides between them. We need to replace the toxic debate and closure of politics and identity politics that is promoted by the authoritarian populists, but also by the establishment neoliberals, with a politics of open debate, not labeling people, promoting critical thought, promoting difference. And last, we need to defend the existing reforms, but in a way that can build people's power. So while we should defend progressive reforms that have happened, for example, anti-racist laws, we should do it in a way that does not put our faith in courts and that does not put our faith in politicians. Okay, I think I, I'm going to sort of leave it there. I've made my main sort of points, comrades, and uh, maybe I can just stop talking for a bit. Okay, I'm done. All right, thanks, comrade. Um, we're just going to open up to the floor and uh, comment any questions or comments. Okay. Comments, is there any questions or comments? Yeah, I don't have anything that's been said. Uh, that's been said. Um, stop. Yeah. Can you elaborate, um, elaborate a bit on Ochaba so that we can get a full picture of what you were saying about Ochaba? Okay. Um, I'm going to take a few questions and then we can do that in a package. Okay, so we'll take three or four questions and then we'll answer. But my question is why since the 1950s has, has the left formations actually not met this challenge of authoritarianism? My question, or uh, I'm very happy to hear what you've said. It is the truth, and I want a question that I would like uh, uh, maybe um, this this labor research can assist us. Of how can we socialize? Uh, how can we socialize? Uh, 
from the last one backwards. I, I think one of the crucial things is that we need to rebuild a, a progressive left infrastructure. Now, when I said these movements, these authoritarian populists are not a response to a rising working class or a threat of revolution, I meant exactly that. The working class movement, although it's actually getting bigger, I mean, there are more people in trade unions worldwide today than there were ever in the past. The working class movement is very weak. It's very thin. So we've got to start to rebuild our infrastructure. And that means, first of all, we need to build our own media. In South Africa in the 1980s, there were well over 150 progressive uh, newspapers, newsletters. There were hundreds of centers where people could educate themselves, organize, hold meetings. And this stuff has all declined. So in order to organize and conscientize our, our working class uh, people, and I'm, I'm including the working class in a broad sense, the poor, the unemployed, those who depend on the upper class to survive, um, we need to start to take back public space. And that means organizing outside of the state. That means organizing alternatives. And I don't mean food gardens. I mean alternative sites of struggle. And that includes building an alternative media. Um, I mean, one of the ironies is actually the big trade unions own a lot of shares in the big media. Power FM, ETV, even that terrible show Top Billing. Trade unions have got a big share. So I think resources do exist. But for resources in the trade unions to be unlocked for these purposes, which I think is essential, the unions also need to have some sort of reform project. There needs to be a, some sort of rank and file driven reform of the big unions in addition to organizing outside of the big unions. Um, the existing media we've got is something which really enables authoritarian populism because the model of existing media is almost like a war media. It is one based on shock and fear. So what you get in a lot of the existing media is not much analysis of what is really going on, very superficial um, descriptions and things that are really tagged to get people upset. That is how the media is working today. So we need to build an alternative to the bourgeois media, that is the private media and the state media, as part of building alternative institutions outside of the state. Now, why have the left formations failed? Um, I, th I think part of it is that... In the 1950s, for example, most of the left was banking on the state. So in the global south, a lot of the left was supporting progressive nationalist anti-imperialist movements. And that meant they were supporting pro projects like import substitution industrialization to develop countries with a colonial history. In much of the west, the left was supporting um, uh, the Keynesian welfare state. And in much of the rest in the east, the left was supporting Marxism-Leninism which has got a centrally planned economy. And you've got mixes of these in different countries. I mean, you've got communist parties in the South, you've got communists in, in uh, the West and so on. Now, all of those models have failed, and there's a range of reasons for it. Uh, one of them is the globalization of capital. Um, another one is the breakdown of class compromises as ruling classes were able to shift the balance of power. And because the left is often really trapped in an older period, um, we, we're trying to, in many cases, provide solutions that can't work anymore. So both Kosatu and NUMSA, their main um, programs for economic reform in South Africa, are models which I would argue would be incredibly difficult to actually get in place in the current neoliberal order. So we need to think out of that box. The second thing, like I say, is that a lot of the left has, has actually misdiagnosed the problem. So for some of the left, it's almost like we're in the 1930s in slow motion where fascism is on the march and Trump is about to become the new Hitler. And I think that's completely misreading the 1930s and, and misreading today. Our task now is actually back to basics. It's not about stopping some sort of imminent fascism. There is no imminent fascism. There's a right-wing drift. 
um, which needs to be fought. But to fight it, we need to build our movements. And to build our movements, we've got to build institutions and we've got to reform the unions and we've got to build an alternative media. Now, Rajava in Syria is, is quite an interesting case, and I'm sure comrades like Aneli and Sean can, can talk about it with more um, expertise and depth than me, but essentially in a lot of the, the so-called Middle East, North Africa uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring, most people were just asking for democracy, but that meant nothing really. They got parliaments, but they weren't able to use them. And the people who took the space were often right-wingers, ISIS or um, Muslim Brotherhood or old-school militarist guys like Assad. But in Rojava in Syria, the Kurdistan Workers' Party movement, in the broad sense, has actually built cooperatives, uh, worker and community councils, a whole communal structure. So trying to build a, a sort of a socialist, democratic egalitarian inclusive order with a strong feminist component that crosses over ethnic tribal national racial and religious barriers with a bottom-up democratic structure of governance so rather than elect a town council you have ordinary people running the town and from there giving some directions to a few executive people so i think that's an alternative where people are trying to build a democracy without the state and a socialism without the state and I think that's that sort of visionary approach, which is where we need to go. Movements like the Landless People's Movement in Brazil, I think, are another important reference point if we want to think about politics differently. Thanks. Okay, answered, yeah. All right, um, comments, any other questions or comments? Yeah, thanks for the <laughs> presentation. Paul. I think my comment will just be um, regarding the unions. Mm. Because you, you, you see we have the losers and we have this... Um, the Kusati is there. I remember the one that we had, no, um, that movement. Mm. That is those meetings that we went to us on uh, United Front. A uh, working class summit was the other one. Um, yeah, yeah, no, we know we were the summit. But you know what the unions is? They came from Kosato and ANC and all those things. Mm. But the problem we have with them is um, they don't want to work in their communities. Mm, mm. They want to use the organizations to do their dirty work. And what they want is they want those positions and then they don't look back. Once they're in those positions, they earn the money, then they forget about the working class, the poor, and you know what? Some of them don't want to be really to be associated with the ones who's unemployed, and that is problematic. Mm -hmm. Because we organization, we are dealing with housing and evictions, and you know, those workers are coming from the areas where we stay, and they are comrades who are, are, are workers within the unions of um, NUSA and Kusatu, but you don't find them on the street when there's action where people are evicted and those type of things. So I think we should start with communities that needs to come together and have this thing that we have to start doing the walking and the talking and not just have the union take the leeway. Because we're giving the right to the union and they run with us thing. And that's the same thing that happened with that um, uh, when we went to that school of this, yeah, the summit of, of NUMSA. Mm. They just came there. They want this political party, and you could see um, Jim. He was, he was, it was like he was now this person is going to be placed into those positions. And I think we have a problem with that, and we're not going to allow those things to happen. What we want is community base that should start from the ground, and we don't want it from the top down. That is what we want. Okay. So you see things on the hand. Um, I'm gonna be sort of chairing. I've got a question, comrade. Um, okay. Do you see this type of politics as possibly future in South Africa? I'm raising it because you will have a, a thing, a party like the ATM that now sits in Parliament. Um, it's explicitly xenophobic. Um. I think for me, and I'm curious about this and what you think, um, 
is a is the if if an authoritarian populist party. The reason why I'm raising it is when you look at some of the the things they actually say. Um, their manifesto they don't mention anything about socialism once. Um, one of their biggest spending things is actually they proposed if they won elections to spend two billion rand um, helping aspirant BE capitalists get shares in in um, in the JSC top JSC companies. Um, so in a way, I would say they certainly use the rhetoric of trying to mobilise the working class, saying they're going to address poverty, saying they're going to address inequality, but. On the other hand, you have like a, a command structure. So I'm interested in what you think of, of that. Is it a misdiagnosis or maybe I want your opinion? Okay. Um. Uh, sorry, Con, there's one more hand, sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to argue with the comment lady that was sitting there. Uh, what, they, what, they, what they do not use it to me. They are using people for their benefits. Now, that's why I said uh, uh, I'm very happy to come on this international labor research. And at least I've got a lot of information that I need. Because the city uses these DLCs, you see them with the directors there, uh, of each. Of, of this department, but I think I'm right. We put the clothes and everything, you know. You find out they want to grab that guy once, once, and once they see that this guy is brilliant. They want to grab you, they, know that they, will, they will give you a, a higher position or they will dismiss you between the two. <coughs> and then, uh, even uh, I'm very happy that Patricia Taylor is a Patricia Taylor was part of everything. Whereby uh, we we have to ask a question as that can you work for three months? Because what they are doing, they are taking contract of three months, six months, six weeks. Who can work for six months, six weeks? Hmm. I, I mean that is an exploitation. Uh, whereby uh, you know said at least your contract must be three years. Uh, through the whole city we got more than four thousand people retired, resigned and all of that, but there is no Good morning, comrades. I uh, just want to, to ask a question to you, leader. Uh, it may be just my own understanding uh, now to be corrected. According to my understanding, the West were for the community, were for the middle class. Just because the capitalists do not want to let go of the power. So they sit on top and they generate all these new policies that will be on their favor. Like we talk of fascism, these new technologies that when you look at it, they are still on the favor on their side. So I just wanted to, uh, to find out from you, what can the mid class do in, to be able to win the struggle back on their favor? Okay. Um, I, I Sorry, think I'm not Okay, no problem. Okay, is, is that is that the package? Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Um. The, the first thing I think is is the question around the unions, and I I think there. To, to me, I, the unions are still very important, but uh, what I'm arguing is the unions have got to be reformed. And what that means is unions require within them a reform led from the ground up inside the unions through, for example, rank and file movements. Because within the unions, um, it's, it's quite clear that union leaderships in many cases are not very accountable to, to the ordinary members of the unions. And there are certainly many cases, I'm not going to name any particular union, but where union leaderships are uni using the unions for their own benefit. So I think the unions have got to be reformed, but the reform of the unions, what some people call union renewal, has to be done from below, from within the unions through independent movements, not parties but through independent movements of ordinary workers in the unions, and that this reform of the unions has to involve first democratizing the unions, that is bringing back or reinstituting or where necessary re 
creating from the scratch um, systems of workers' control, but it also has to be tied to a vision of where the unions want to go. Because what our unions have also got, as I think comrades have indicated, they've got tied into the thing that politics means parties. So you don't see the unions these days in big popular struggles. You didn't see the unions now protesting around their attacks on foreigners in South Africa. You don't see that. The unions have essentially outsourced politics to parties. So if it's Kasatu, they outsourced it to ANC and the Communist Party. If it's Inumsa, they've outsourced their politics essentially to their new Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party. Even a, even a union like Solidarity is aligned to a party, the Freedom Front Plus. So. Uh, a reform of unions means, on the one side, democratizing unions, but on the other side also means winning the argument for a, a new vision of unions that unions need to organize from below, need to organize with communities, need to put their resources in, in, in the way of building a popular power, a counter power from below. So I think the current way that unions are interacting with communities is, is completely incorrect. I think it's, I agree with the comrades, it's completely incorrect. Unions just coming in announcing they're present and expecting community support. You've got to rebuild the links with the communities. You can't just come in from on high and say this is how it's going to roll. All right, so for both unions and communities, what I'm talking about is the need to build a revolutionary counterculture. So we need... To, that's a fancy way of saying we need to win a lot of ordinary people over to the need to go beyond capitalism and the state to have a democratic society in which we control the economy directly, um, a society in which we can debate and disagree on things and be tolerant of difference, where it's okay to disagree, where disagreeing and having different views is fine. We need to move away from a toxic politics that if someone disagrees with you, they're an enemy or a counter-revolutionary. We need to move away from thinking that the state is going to save us. The state is not going to save us. It doesn't matter who owns the Reserve Bank, you will still be exploited. It doesn't matter who owns ESCOM, you will still be exploited. It doesn't matter if a court case against Samanco uh, or the gold mining companies wins, you will still be exploited. So we've got to fundamentally get direct working class power over the economy. And that means we can democratically plan the economy from below. And that's why I think things like Rajavar or the landless people or landless workers movement in Brazil are very crucial examples. Now, in terms of EFF, I think EFF brings out the complexity very well because the shift towards the right internationally isn't neatly confined into parties. So it's not like you can easily map it onto one party. Somebody like Donald Trump it represents a group in the Republican Party in America, but not the whole Republican Party. Boris Johnson in uh, Britain is the same case. So it's a thing which isn't just confined to these parties. It's a broader thing in society. Now, I think the EFF definitely has very real potential to evolve into this direction. I think at the moment the EFF is a sort of... Uh, mix of nationalism, Marxism, Leninism, and elements of authoritarian populism. And I think that authoritarian populist uh, dynamic of the EFF is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. I think it was hidden away when uh, the EFF was fighting with Zuma, because that could at least be construed as a fight around democracy. But I think if you look at the way the EFF is now dealing with, uh, for example, the state capture commissions, the Zondo Commission, Provin Gordon, the way it is involved in looting schemes at the leadership level, uh, the way it essentially sounds very much like Zuma did three years ago, I, I think that indicates very much uh, the EFF has definitely got the potential to evolve in that direction. Now, people don't really want to get onto that debate because obviously the EFF has got popular support. And obviously there's a difference between the EFF leaders and people who support the EFF. But I would say uh, to the comrade, yes, I think the EFF can definitely evolve in this direction, as can sections of the African National Congress, which are doing so already. Uh, the Mogashuli faction is a good example. Um, and as our other forces outside of there, I mean, then, then what is it, the National Democratic Party, okay, it's Party 48 in the last election, their slogan was openly, South Africa, Mzanzi for South Africans only. So I think it, it could cohere around somewhere unexpected. It may not be within just one party. Okay, I, I hope that sort of helps. Um, uh, and thanks again for all of those questions. It's a lot of uh, food for thought. And thanks for your time as well. Yeah, thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have any more questions, comments, and a round of questions? One last one. Okay.
So, uh, one last more question with everything you just said. Are you saying that uh, now it's time for social movements to experiment with anarchism? Yes. Okay. Um, look, my, my view is that we, we need to rethink politics a bit. Um, overall, and I think it's being said also by comrades there, that the, the political party system is a rotten system. That's why people are going for populism, because it's obvious that the main parties are not bringing any change. So people supporting right-wing populists is a response to that very real situation. People are hoping a an outlier, somebody who promises to drain the swamp, will make the difference. But those people are part of that party system. So I think we need to be thinking about ways to do politics at a distance from the state. And whether we call that anarchism or syndicalism or libertarian communism, for me, it doesn't matter that much. In the 1980s, we had probably have called a lot of that people's power or workers' control. What matters for me is to have a politics that doesn't follow the current system, that is not hung up on elections, that is not pursuing power in the state, that is not a stepping stone for ambitious individuals, a politics driven from below by the working class for the working class, which will put the working class itself directly in power, which will not outsource power uh, to the state because the working class can't control the state. We're not hand power to a party, because the working class control the parties, but rather a movement based on community-based organizations, democratic trade unions, student movements, movements of the unemployed, and so on. So that shouldn't just be a protest movement that is complaining about what's wrong now. That's a movement that should also be aiming at a fundamental redistribution of wealth and power in society. And that means fundamentally having ordinary people in charge of their neighborhoods, workers in charge of their workplaces, people in charge of their daily lives, and not waiting every five years to put a piece of paper in a, in a box so somebody can count it and you can elect somebody who will break their promises to you anyway. So if we want to call that anarchism, it's, it's fine. But for me, the, the end goal must be to have a society where we democratically control the economy, where we've removed inequality between people, where we have a real say in what happens in our daily lives and in which production is for need, not profit, and distribution is on the base of need. So a society without money, a society without classes, a society without the oppression of women, of black people, a society without xenophobia, and a society that is really global, that unites humanity into a universal human community. So I, I think trying to get a solution through Parliament we tried, we failed, it doesn't work. Trying to get a solution through the nation state, we've tried, it's failed. That's what populism is telling us. Those old solutions have failed. If we keep trying to revive the failed solutions, we're simply going to leave the populists uh, in the running because they are doing a better job of saying the old systems have failed. The problem is they have no solutions. Uh, the problem is their politics make things worse. But they're responding to the real thing. The left is in a crisis, the old models have failed, and people are suffering everywhere. So we've got to build on that, but with a progressive, alternative, libertarian, bottom-up, class-based, non-racial, working-class politics that is socialist in the real meaning of the sense, uh, in the real sense of the word. Thanks, comrade. Comrade, two last questions. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Comrade, because that was, uh, I mean, very helpful and, and informative. In, but um, on your last um, uh, input, you, you mentioned that uh, social movements and mm. social organizations should start to think of building their own, um, their own infrastructure, you mentioned media and stuff. Mm. But what I would like to maybe to throw the pot of uh, it could be a way forward an anarchism or maybe add because the distance between where we are as social movements and where we want to mm. be clear, which is to have our own power taken back, and then the distance in between is in either resource or resourceless. Mm. So how do you start then build those resources as social movements? Because as I look at the room here now. Uh, which I'm part of those social movements that might be operating, having the privilege of operating from a 5,000 rand budget a month, mm -hmm. or even less than that. So, but how do you start to move? Because when we talk about this stuff, 
I'm encouraging me to have talk about issue resources, if I can, mm-hmm. I can be realistic. So if then you don't put your, your faith in, in, in the state or in, in, in politicians, um, so where do you, how do you start to move forward? Okay. Look, okay. that, that's a very important point. Look, the, the one thing is, I mean, when when people build. Oh, okay, sure, no problems, no problems. Let's take the other one, and then we'll come back to that as well. There's another question there, sir. Hi, I'm Comrade. I was going to just ask again what things uh, I'm going to ask you what some of us maybe might not know. Um, what, what is a uh, euphemism? What is the definition of it? Sorry, Com, I didn't get you clear. Uh, it's just the sound it's, isn't so great. Uh, don't you know maybe perhaps what is the definition of euphemism? Euphemism, okay. Thanks, Com. I'll do that. Um, uh, are there any others, Com? <laughs> okay. So I, I think uh, the, the one comrade was uh, the question around the word euphemism. A euphemism is a is a polite word for an ugly thing. So a euphemism would be, you know, to say um, somebody has passed rather than somebody is dead. Um, you know. So. Yeah, but look, uh, comrade, the thing is, on what are the resources? I, I mean, the, the one thing is, in the 1980s, people in very similar conditions with a much more repressive state were able to build very powerful social movements in South Africa. So I think that points to the first resource is actually the people themselves. Um, they were able to develop people's capacities, not just to, to say slogans, but to organize. Um, they were able to organize community-based meetings. They were able in some ways to access resources from even elements of sympathetic middle class like radical students. So I think the first thing is the first resources is the capacity of ordinary people. And that means building their um, their solidarity, building their understanding of the issues and activating them as people. The second thing is with there's ways we can try to access some resources like a lot of those 1980s movements drew resources down from progressive student movements like NUSAS and so on. But I think it's also where the reform of the unions is crucial because the unions today have actually got a hell of a lot of resources, like billions of rand. I think it's 20 billion rand. So we need to also be thinking about putting pressure on the unions for some of those resources. The, uh, the other thing I want to mention is, is that um, when, when we think about the resources as well, this, I'm not talking about people building an economy that is separate from, from the, the capitalist system. I, I don't think it's possible for poor communities to solve their poverty through cooperatives and uh, self-help schemes. I think those things are important as a way of building cohesion. But I think fundamentally the struggle itself can win resources. And I, I'll give an example that is from South America in Argentina. Some of the social movements in Buenos Aires and Argentina, when they protest and blockade roads, they don't ask for money or a memorandum to the government. They actually ask for equipment. So you get some social movements whose demand has been, for example, for welding machines and for iron and for bricks. So I think um, the one resource is people, but struggles themselves can win more resources. I always think it's an indictment of Kasatu that a union like Solidarity, which is uh, very problematic, super problematic politically, is able to set up its own technicon, is able to set up its own media. So I think we've got more resources than we think, but fundamentally the resource is actually us. Um, and the last thing I'd say here, this is where I, th- I really want to say uh, to, to indicate my respect for what Ilrig is doing. Because these sort of winter schools and political schools and globalization schools are, are another way that we can access resources for communities and for workers. So I think we've got to build from below, but I think we've got to avoid dependence on funders. We've got to build from below and avoid getting involved in deals with parties. Uh, we've got to see what resources we have, and we've got to try and unlock some of those resources. I, I think that's about the best I can answer here. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Gordon, and thanks for your time. No, no problem. Thanks, thanks everyone for having me. Thanks very much. All right. yeah. Yeah.